on news that President Trump was floating a potential payroll tax cut, among other economic stimulus concepts, futures were up 3% on average last night moving into pre-market. But at the opening bell today, markets did gap open and for a brief moment, a brief moment, speculators thought the lows might be in. However, that brief moment in time was quickly stripped away as markets continued their relentless sell-off. In cryptocurrency, Bitcoin saw that same glimmer of hope as well, going on a march starting last evening until it too was slapped down like a petulant toddler reaching for the cookie jar, pushing price back down this morning into the 7,000s for a potential retest of the lows. Altcoins, meanwhile, put in mixed gains today with outliers Loopring, Steam, and Ren, not to be overshadowed by consistent performers Kyber Network and Blockstacks putting in good returns for the day. Meanwhile, in today's episode, we'll talk about how the pandemic might affect Bitcoin mining in China. Will we see an exodus of hashing power from the mainland into alternative countries such as the United States and Canada? We'll also break down your favorite indices, contracts for difference, ETFs, and Forex, in today's episode of Breaking Bitcoin. Stay tuned. I'm Joseph Abadi from Blockchain Economics and you're watching Breaking Bitcoin. Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin, recorded live in the underground bunker. Today is, is uh, Tuesday. March 10th, 2020. This is your daily source for everything's markets and finance. We are broadcasting live to YouTube, Twitch, DLive, Facebook Live, and we're on television if you have the Investor News Channel app. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and turn on all notifications. Hit the thumbs up button and leave a comment down below letting us know what you've learned today. If you have any questions, drop them in the live chat and the moderators will direct my attention to them. We've got a lot to cover today. Let's not waste any time. Let's get right to the live scene for today's section of market analysis. Uh, starting off in cryptocurrency as we are wont to do. You guys know how things happen here. Again, let me know. Let me know in the live chat how you guys are doing. We'll start off on Bitcoin. Uh, let's just give an overview of the markets. Bitcoin currently trading today at about 7,800. Ethereum back under $200 at 198. XRP struggling, putting in a little bit of positivity here, struggling to get back over 20 cents. Nice Darth Maul candle on the daily. Similar with EOS, struggling to get back above $3, trading at $3.05. Litecoin continuing to fall off, now below $50 at 49. Uh, Binance Bucks, BNB down still below. $20 at 1660 struggling to stay above $16. Uh, Cardano, which I am still short on, currently sitting at 524 sats. And OG and Origin Protocol still holding strongly above 40 cents, sitting at 44.6 on the daily. Let's get down into Bitcoin and break down what we're going to be looking at. All right. <clears throat> so we'll start off again, taking a brief look at the monthly as we are wont to do. We talked about this previously. Again, Current bias is bouncing back and forth between current level of supply sitting between 9242, 10,148 to our level of demand currently sitting at 6928. We've gone over our lower downside targets. Of course, we have the 55 exponential moving average on the monthly coming in at 5393, giving us some good confluence with a slight variance with that lower level of demand currently right now. Switching to the weekly, again, we see something very similar, that same descent. This is currently our third bearish weekly candle. Of course, it's only Tuesday. We do need to wait until the weekly closes to have any deterministic data. We have a potential retest of the 100 simple moving average that is currently sitting at 74.19. However, again, lower downside target stretching down to 55.16, which is the 200 weekly simple moving average. Has some nice confluence with both that level of demand and also uh the we the monthly 55 exponential moving average currently sitting right now things that i'm watching for that would be good positive signs would be a weekly close back above the 55 exponential moving average and a monthly close uh back above our open of february's sell-off so we need to close the monthly back above 9339 let's call it 9400 so a monthly close higher than 9400 i think would be quite positive would lead us to a retest of our current overhead uh, in my in my opinion, penultimate level of resistance currently sitting at 12,200. Again, you can say it's 12,000, you can say it's 13,000, but when we're closing monthly candles above that, rest assured, we will be stretching and testing those all-time highs. 
Again, on the weekly, fairly similar right here. The only thing that we have underneath us is going to be the 100 weekly simple moving average. It did support price on this previous decline. Uh, again, we've got a little bit of a ways to go if we do want to retest the upper level of this channel that we talked about that we broke out of. But again, other than that, things are fairly simple. The breaking Bitcoin system and PTP systems guiding us very well on the daily as they should. Uh, we covered this on the weekly, looking at the breaking Bitcoin indicator. And again, we can look at the breaking Bitcoin indicator or for, again, all members in the group, we can simply look at what your PTP systems are signaling anyways. Uh, looking at the weekly time frame right here, you can see we've closed below the baseline. So for weekly time frame traders, clearly being hedged and an at risk shorts is valid. We tripped the breaking Bitcoin initiator bearish on the previous weekly close signaling for short trades. Uh, if we look at the rest of our indicators as well, we had Wadatar explosion confirmation with a rising explosion level on that same candle. And on the current weekly close, we are going to be getting Minx and Parallax confirmation as well. Now, for me, the breaking Bitcoin system only needs one other level of confirmation. As you guys will know, Wadatar explosion is going to cover volume. And if you bring in a rising explosion level, volatility, that's really all the confirmation you need because the breaking Bitcoin system already has an initiator and confirmer built into it. But again, if we take that system off of there and simply use the baseline, you guys immediately have the exact same system. Not the exact same system, but something that's very similar, right? And again, we got a no trade candle. What's interesting here is we talked about how the weekly candle closed below actually the baseline, the baseline proper, but not below the baseline channel, which all of you guys might have slightly modified uh, back over here on the 24th of February weekly close. Uh, but you can see from the baseline indicator, we got a no trade signal and we got the OK to trade signal on the previous weekly close. So again, weekly shorts are in order here. Of course, weekly time frame hedging as well. Getting down to the daily time frame. Daily time frame things are fairly clear here. Uh, we currently have the breaking. Uh, we currently have the baseline sitting at 89.87. So we do need to see a daily close back above 89.87 to be looking for at-risk longs at this point in time. Uh, we also need to be closing above 92. Uh, excuse me, 92.42 uh, to be flipping the initiator long to be signaling for the signal for at-risk shorts. That's my system. For you guys, it's going to be slightly different. Continuation filter sitting at 85.74. A close above 85.74 is going to be invalidating short trades right now at this point in time. Looking at the rest of our indicators, we have a little bit of declining negative volume delta coming in from water tar explosion. Again, not telling us to exit short trades whatsoever. We still have a rising explosion level, so volatility is still expanding. Uh, we do have minks in the oversold territory currently right now, which is interesting. We'll look at that here in just a second. Parallax is obviously still bearish. Uh, but again, all traditional systems are going to be continuing to confirm and signal short right now on this candle. Again, not the correct entry candle, not the correct entry candle, but the correct sustained candle with one slight fly in the ointment, which we'll cover here in just a little bit. All right, looking at significant moving averages again here on the daily, we are below all of these. We are getting not only the uh, not only did we get the daily 1355 cross under over here and then exact, you know, I want to point that out because I talk about that a lot. And as you guys will recall, I even talked about this as it was happening. So daily 1355 moving average cross unders. What do we get? We get the cross under confirmed. Uh, let's double check. Let's just zoom in here a little bit. We'll open up the data window and we can see. 9062. Oh, so it occurred on this candle. The 3rd of March is when we got the 1355 daily uh, moving average cross under, right? And what happens as so often happens, we do put in a two, we put in, uh, well, we put in a, a doji, which is this is an unexciting day in the market. And then two days of recovery, we drive back, we correct to retest that level to retest the moving averages. And then we close back below, which is the confirmation. So for those trading that moving average 1355 strategy that I've talked about many times, which doesn't happen all the time. It's it's a uh, what I like to call a rarer signal, right? It's kind of a system that you implement and you watch once in a while. Bottom feeder is very similar to this. It's not something that gives you a signal all the time, but when it does, you act on it, right? So this is one of those kind of discretionary situations. And as I've said, how do you build, how do you make, how do you graduate from being a mechanical trader to a discretionary trader? Well, you build your mechanical system. And as you are building your system, as you are back testing and as you are trading, right? Takes a couple of years. You note, all of these interesting discretionary components as I have, uh, and you write them down and then you go and back test them with the skills that you've learned from building a mechanical system. 
And then you can begin implementing those with your risk management system and with your discipline that you've learned from being a mechanical trader into having either a primary discretionary rules-based trading strategy or a side discretionary rules-based trading strategy, which is how I operate. I am a primarily mechanical trader. I have several backup, not backup, but supplemental discretionary rules-based algorithms, let's say, bottom feeder being one, right? Which is where it doesn't, I the, the majority of my trades are mechanical based on my mechanical system. Then every once in a while, I get a discretionary signal and I act upon that, right? It's very rare that I actually, um, it's very rare that I actually will take a discretionary trade in the sense that I'm looking at the chart and I'm making subjective analysis and I believe that this is going to happen and I take a trade based off of that. It's very rare that I do that. It's very rare that I do that because I don't think it is a high probability of success. Um, So what's going to be invalidating that short of setup right now, a close above the 13, or if you want to be a little bit more conservative, a close above the 55 at this point in time, uh, signaling that. Although again, uh, bringing back our major moving averages again, bringing back our major, major moving averages again, we can see we've closed below 200 simple moving average. We consolidated around it for about a week and then finally closed below it in a pretty massive penultimate after we rejected from the 21 exponential moving average. That's about all we have here right now. Again, breaking Bitcoin systems fairly clear right now as to what to do, getting the continuation signal on this candle and getting some nice follow through so far. All right. Now, one thing that I do want to point out and we will check and see if it is still valid. Yes, uh, is the bottom feeder signal. We are getting a bottom feeder signal on the daily. So this is going to be again, by the way, I published um, the bottom feeder strategy and indicator over the weekend, as well as the Kodrigo ATR updates. Uh, everything was fine for the entire day of Monday. And then last evening, last evening, I did, uh, uh, I did see that there is an issue with bottom feeder access on TradingView. I'll resolve that today. My team will resolve that today and you guys will be just fine. So this will be fixed by the evening close, um, both for traditional markets and for cryptocurrency. So this will be fixed by 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, not a big, not a big issue. I just have to, I just have to uh, update something. Anyways, um, so bottom feeder is signaling on the daily. Uh, let's look closely at what kind of signal that we're getting. Again, bottom feeder designed to be my exit indicator uh, and also a reversal system. Uh, so bottom feeder is signaling for a trade right now with a take profit of eighty three thirty nine and a stop loss of seventy two fifty one. <coughs> so uh, again, taking a look at uh, how bottom feeder performs. This is on conservative mode. Let's stretch this to 2021 so we can get more accurate data in here. Again, uh, there we go. So that's what we'll be doing today. I'll be closing out my short trade today on the candle close, waiting for the candle close, and then taking that move into the upside. I will remain hedged as we are below the baseline. Uh, but I also understand those who would want to unhedge and then hedge back up. That's going to be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more active, gives you more to manage. And of course, your downside risk is low because remember, bottom feeders only, depending on time frame or market, only accurate about 80 to 87% of the time. That's a very accurate indicator, right? It's a very accurate indicator. Uh, however, it is wrong, of course, once in a while. And the difference between taking a loss on a trade and a loss on all of your equity is quite enormous, right? So, uh, so you always want to be trading in the safest manner possible, especially with global volatility and global rebound. Now, interestingly enough, if I had to call a market bottom, if I had to call a market low, it would be in about one week uh, on the 18th after the Fed meeting uh, to discuss interest rates. Uh, I do expect them to slash interest rates by another 50 basis points, maybe another 75 basis points. And... Uh, so if I had to expect, I would say the 17th or 18th. So we'll see. And I think we'll see Bitcoin move up with the rest of the markets on that date. Uh, so I think we can get a one to three month recovery after following that, following the Fed meeting, depending on what they do with interest rates. Uh, and then we'll kind of move along from there. This is all this will be in my analysis coming out later this week. OK, so. Uh, that's Bitcoin. Fairly simple, fairly easy. Again, we talked about the bottom feeder signal, uh, but traditional systems are still uh, in the negative. 
uh, looking at Ethereum. Again, Ethereum trading under $200, having kind of the same whipsaw movement back up to the upside today, but again, still basically trading exactly what we are, where we are. Uh, same as yesterday, doji candle inverse of yesterday's. Yesterday was a positive doji candle. Today is looking, uh, shaping up to be a negative uh, doji candle. Uh, let's look at... First, our breaking Bitcoin system. Keep this very clear. Uh, Ethereum has more work to do than Bitcoin currently to regain its bullish bias. We need to close above 251.14 to regain the daily baseline and be bullish. Uh, we need to close above 263.87. So let's call it 263.80 uh, to be to be signaling for at-risk shorts. Now, of course, these levels will move down over the course of the week. I think it's highly unlikely that we just charge right back up above $250 from where we're currently at. We're going to be looking at some slogging, guys, one way or another. Uh, continuation filter currently sitting at 223.82. That's the level we need to close above to invalidate shorts and put us in a no trade zone between that level and the baseline is a no trade zone. So still hedged, still short on Ethereum. Uh, however, I'm going to be following along with the uh, bottom feeder indicator and exiting this trade. So again, pulling some nice profits out of Ethereum and Bitcoin, not as much as I wanted to, but still having a profitable trade, assuming that the daily closes favorably for me and then we don't rally uh, before the end of the day. Uh, we'll look at that here in just a little bit. Uh, now, I did want to look at different time frames. I apologize for Bitcoin as I normally do. Uh, 12 hour is still bearish. Uh, we did get a nice continuation, uh, you know, confirmation short. Uh, we are getting from Minx a take profit short signal on the current 12 hour candle though. So if one would have shorted here, Again, you're not getting as much profit as you wanted, although I think you would have hit TP1 on this move into the downside, about a 5% movement. So let's just double check. Could we go? Yeah, we would have definitely hit take profit one on these wicks right here. So you would have already been out at break even. But regardless, if you had not moved your stop loss to break even, uh, you would be getting a take profit short signal from Minx right now. Uh, and on the four hour, the four hour has been interesting on, uh, on Bitcoin right here. Uh, let's see. Again, the four hour, as I talked about, uh, giving you the four hour short signal right over here uh, at three o'clock in the morning on the 8th of March, central time. Uh, so for those of you who are Pacific time, you guys could have got the, caught that at 1 a.m. Uh, for Eastern time, you guys would have had to been up at 4 a.m. But regardless, you could have caught it on this candle as well, waking up a little bit later, seven o'clock in the morning for me. No excuse not to be up by seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, and a nice movement to the downside, getting the exit signal from the breaking Bitcoin system here, uh, from Minx right here at the absolute low, from the continuation filter right here. So uh, right across this 12 hour span, you had a good exit system from the four hour. Uh, then we're in a no trade zone. Uh, you get a continuation, but not from Minx, possibly from just the continuation filter. Uh, and so far, you're just right at break even so far currently on that trade. So really nothing to do here. Here on the four hour, you're going to be bullish above 81.14, closing above the four hour baseline, and it'll be signaling that you could take longs above 82.48. Of course, we're going to need volume and volatility. Looking at WADA, it is largely telling us to stay out of the market right now on the four hour time frame. Uh, XRP interesting today as we're putting in a little bit of uh, contrary movements to the rest of the market, but still not very powerful. Uh, XRP has been actually very easy to trade. Uh, let's see here. We got our initial short signal right here on XRP, gearing us up for this movement right here, and potentially right here as well. If you took the non, uh, if you took the non, um, if you took the non rising volatility, uh, non rising volatility signal, so kind of the weak signal from what our explosion. Uh, so fairly easy to trade, very consistent, hedged on XRP margin since we closed below the baseline or potentially taking an at-risk short here if you're ignoring the continuation filter uh, or if you have a different volume confirmation. Again, could be whatever, however you guys want to do it. Uh, now, currently, XRP needs to get back above 24 uh, and a half cents. So 24.64, not 0.2464 to be bullish and need to get above almost 26 cents. Uh, to be signaling for a long on my system. Shorts are going to be invalidated, closing above 22.61. Uh, so about 23 cents, let's call it, 22 and a half cents. Uh, so far, we don't have any of that. We are getting a take profit short signal from Minx right now, which is interesting to note. Uh, and bottom feeder is not algorithmically successful on XRP, so we will be ignoring those signals at this point in time. You want to make sure that you're testing the back tester because I published the strategy tester so you guys can go and see what markets this works very well on. As you guys will see, it works fantastically well on things like Matic, um, you know, VTC, 
all different kinds of markets, but not on XRP, not on EOS, and not on uh, Ethereum. It works very well on BTC. Uh, so uh, that's pretty clear here. Looking at the 12 hour on XRP, uh, similarly again, 12 hour short signal. However, interesting to note, out, to note out here with XRP, you are getting a reversal baseline bounce setup, very high, uh, very low risk, high reward trade. So if you close here above on the 12 hour, if you close above 2186, 0.2186, that will invalidate the trade. So again, you're looking for a 12 hour, you have a 12 hour window of opportunity to be proven right or wrong on this trade. Taking a reversal baseline bounce, which means you would be entering short on the current candle. You would be looking for take profit targets of 20 cents, 18.9, and 17.9 cents. Hard stop at 22.68. 1% risk, trading the direction of the daily trend, always is a profitable strategy. Uh, four hours largely telling you to stay out of the market. Again, you get the four hour take profit short signal here on XRP, pretty much at the bottom. You do miss one four hour decline. Uh, you get the breaking Bitcoin exit right here at the lows as well. Uh, and we are set up for another reversal baseline bounce. This would be telling you to go short if the four hour closes below uh, 20.65 cents, 0 0.2065. Uh, Parallax bearish, Minx bearish as well, getting rejected from the zero line. Uh, volume and volatility not really quite there yet. So uh, largely, I think the major pairs are telling us to stay flat at the moment. Uh, EOS as well, currently trading at $3.08. Trying to stay above that $3 mark right there. Looking at the daily breaking Bitcoin, shorts are invalidated if on a daily close above $3.42, but we need to get back above $3.69 to be signaling long. $3.88 is where we need to get above to be going um, actually uh, at risk long again. Um, looking at our indicators right here, uh, Minx is oversold. Parallax is getting oversold as well. Potential exit indicators as well as we are starting to get a little overextended to the downside. And EOS has been sold off pretty ferociously, of course. Guys, remember that this can continue to go down, uh, but oversold is more important in cryptocurrency than overbought. Overbought doesn't matter. Oversold tends to. So I am actually expecting that crypto can see a little bit of a bounce here on our major dollar pairs. And I'll be looking at those... Uh, I'll be looking, as I said, I'll be taking the action that I talked about earlier tonight at the daily close. Uh, coming here down to the 12 hour chart here on EOS USD. Again, getting the take profit short signal from uh, EOS USD right here on the 12 hour time frame. And on the four hour time frame, we got the take profit signal right here, pretty much at the lows. But of course, we got the trade on this candle right here, catching all of this and take profit short signal right here. So pretty good. Parallax is still bearish. Minx is still bearish. Minx is actually potentially. So here's what's interesting. Uh, we might be getting a shorter time frame uh, short signal right here uh, it, because Minx seems to be crossing. Uh, Minx seems to want to cross back out of static, uh, which is a continuation short signal below the four hour baseline. And we want to close below the continuation filter, it seems here at 3.007 on EOS USD over on Coinbase. So watch that pretty closely. Again, you might be able to take EOS as a uh, kind of a hedge against some of the long trades that you might be taking in these overextended areas uh, because, you know, EOS is going to be signaling for a short potentially on the four hour. Let's see how we close. We've got about two hours and 33 minutes. If we close below three dollars, um, three double oh seven. Do, 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 do. So pretty cool stuff to see there. Anyways, um, Litecoin again, trading right at fifty dollars right now, struggling to get about fifty dollars as it continues to get sold off. On the daily, we need to get about $56.60 to invalidate shorts. We got to march up to 69, 63.97 uh, to be bullish again. Down on the 12 hour, uh, what are we getting? We are getting a take profit short signal on the 12 hour and on the four hour, we got our take profit short signal over here. And we are getting, uh, interestingly enough, Litecoin here looking like EOS wants to give a continuation short signal. We need to close below $49.02 and we might be getting that continuation short signal. Minx is already confirming it right here. So again, maybe watch EOS, maybe watch Litecoin, maybe look to establish short positions or shorter turn time frame short positions on those as you look to take at least Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum to the upside here.
Uh, B and B doesn't really need any talking about. There's no action to take on B and B. Origin Protocol, which I'm still long on, is sitting up about 45.85, having a nice march to the upside again. Doji candles right now. I've only got about 20% of my position left on Origin. I've pulled about 30% profit out of that trade so far. So I'm largely sitting on the sidelines here. Uh, and Cardano, I am still short on watching that to the downside, especially if we get a nice movement to the upside here on Bitcoin. Then, uh, then it might be good. That's what I'd be watching to see. I'd be watching to see my Cardano profits kind of be established. And again, Cardano being very, very weak. Remember, uh, typically when you're doing sector trading, you want to be long the weakest pair, or excuse me, you want to be long the strongest pair of any sector. You want to be short the weakest pair of any sector, right? All right, looking at traditional markets right now, SPY having a little bit of a rebound now, moving back up, marching above 279.44. Again, as you can see, markets gapped open very strongly this morning and immediately got sold off to retest the lows. And we are currently having a 50% retracement on that right now. If we go to the lower time frames, again, we can see uh, overall, is there really anything that is, you know, kind of supremely exciting? No, we are marching our way back up 50%, currently back up to that same level of initiation of selling. Right now, this is... Um, uh, you know, this is this is important to watch, right? You know, we've sold off to the lows, came back to retest. This is a double top essentially here down the lower time frames, watching for this too, as Andrew Munns uh, succinctly pointed out, watching the NQ rollover, very similar over here on the SPY. Uh, but let's keep it very clear. Let's go to the daily, talk about the way that we trade. Uh, BB here on the daily, again, called for the continuation short, grabbing this last gap to the downside. We got the short signal over here, grabbing this gap to the downside. Uh, I mean, just things don't get very much beautiful than this. Take profit short signal right here, continuation right here. So two of the biggest short trades, uh, two of the biggest short trades on the daily, on the SPY that we could have caught. Uh, just, just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, again, we talked about doing this, taking this trade with SDS or SH or SPXU, which are inverse ETFs for Americans. Of course, you can also, if you're not an American and you would prefer to trade contracts for difference, it was very easy. You got the exact same signal on the SPX, the CFD over on Awanda. Uh, Depay guy asks, where do you all trade indexes? So again, if you are a non-American, you can trade indexes very easily. Uh, in the form of contracts for difference on a Wanda or the broker of your choice. If you're an American, you can't trade contracts for difference, so you're going to have to trade ETFs. So again, as I said, when trading the SPY, I don't really recommend trading the SPY. I recommend trading the, well, you know, of course, the SPY is an ETF, but there, I prefer trading leveraged ETFs. So uh, for shorting the SPY, as I talked about, SH, which is 1X, uh, SDS, which is 2X, and SPXU, which is 3X. So I like ETF trading. I'm not biased because my biggest trade of the year was drip. Pulled 70% on this trade. All right. Uh, anyways, uh, but looking at the SPY right now, again, I think this is kind of nice to see, uh, but I don't see any significant bottom here. I think that this is going to continue is SH on Awanda. What platform? Oh, uh, so uh, Weeble, um, uh, Charles Schwab. Robinhood, which I'm not actively recommending Robinhood anymore because uh, I talked about this yesterday. I'm moving my funds off of Robinhood and onto Webull and um, uh, 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 Charles Schwab. Uh, there's a link down in the description. Uh, you can get uh, two free stocks from Webull. One stock, uh, you can just sign up for Webull. It's absolutely free. You get a stock worth up to $250. The second stock, if you deposit any amount of money, is worth up to $1,400. So pretty sweet deal from Webull. Again, moving 50% of my funds from Robinhood onto Webull and moving the other 50% onto Charles Schwab. So you can trade these on Charles Schwab. Uh, further downside on the S&P. Short term, I don't quite know. Uh, over the next week, I do expect us to actually establish some new lows right here. So yes, overall further downside. Again, I'm going to be watching the Fed meeting pretty closely on the 17th and the 18th. I'm going to be watching these on the 17th and the 18th, or excuse me, the Fed meeting on the 17th and the 18th to see what they do with interest rates. Again, I'm almost certain that they're going to slash interest rates by another 50 basis points. I'm about 50% confident that they're actually going to do 75 basis points. Um, and if they do that, we're going to see the markets rebound for a month to three months. Uh, a call in it right here. You're going to see a one to three month recovery um, on traditional markets, particularly the SPY, particularly the indices. Um, and then we'll kind of see. We'll kind of have to sit on the sidelines and see, right? I mean, the... 
the 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 media is certainly not helping you know the panic right now as i talked about listen uh, i don't actually think that we are on the brink of economic collapse i know that all everybody comes out of the woodwork you know the gold bugs come out of the woodwork and i'm a sound money guy i'm a hard money guy i'm a bitcoin guy but everybody comes out of the woodworks and they're like this is it this is when the entire world goes down the tube zombies walking around eating flesh no food in the markets everything dead catastrophe everywhere I was right. <coughs> and that's not going to happen, guys. That's not that's not going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to have a we're going to have a sell off. Everybody's going to panic. Um, the pandemic is going to do what it's going to do. And then we're going to keep moving on. We're going to keep moving on. The markets are going to recover. Uh, Bitcoin's going to moon. Uh, just all the stuff, all the stuff, man. Uh, we're not we're not going into a worldwide recession. Uh, I mean, we certainly could if people act stupidly enough, uh, but none of the data for me suggests that at this point in time, right? None of the data for me suggests that at this point in time. This is a uh, this is a massive, massive uh, panic. This is panic in the markets. I think that people are largely overreacting economically. The media is certainly not helping this. Uh, the media is certainly not helping this with them just hammering this idea of economic collapse. I think there's a political machination in there. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I think long-term guys in a year, we're going to be fine. We're going to be right back where we were. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, I think that this is overall, I think this is an opportunity for people kind of long-term to establish positions in cryptocurrencies in stocks and ETFs that, you know, prices are getting pretty cheap. I think the prices can go lower. I think that we could see another 10% maybe even 15% decline more in traditional markets. Uh, oil, I have, uh, you know, again, I took my profit on oil. Oil is going to do what it does. I really need to sit on the sidelines and wait for oil to do a thing right now. Uh, but largely, I think that we're going to have uh, a good positive movement. Again, I've been very consistent on this. You know, I talked about the fact that we're going to see a decline. Uh, and now I'm being consistent on the fact, just as I talked about yesterday and previous days before, that this is not the end of the world, guys. Everything's going to be okay. You know, again, dollar cost average down. If you're a long-term investor, if you are a long-term investor, just dollar cost average down into the assets that you are interested in buying. Blue chip stocks, uh, ETFs, uh, cryptocurrencies that you that you think have a strong use case and a potential to change the world, right? Buy things that you think will change the world, right? I'll be talking about this in the premium mentoring session tomorrow when I talk about what fundamentals to consider. I'm very different in this from what you'll typically hear. Uh, and this is potentially why I'm a successful investor. But I'll talk about the things that I look at when determining what things to invest in long term. Um, yeah, by the way, uh, this, this just, just a slight note, right? Uh, I can't remember what the name of the company was, but, uh, it was a hand sanitizer startup and they raised $1.75 million yesterday. So if you are a hand sanitizer startup, now is your time. Now is your time. If you are a M95, uh, mask, uh, kind of, uh, if you can make an M95 mask that's aesthetically pleasing and, you know, kind of, kind of sexy looking, now is your time, guys. Now is your time. Start those startups, man. Take advantage. All right. So anyways, we're looking at the spy right now. Uh, we do need to, we, we need to close above 293.25 to invalidate shorts from a technical perspective, right? Uh, we need to close back above 313.66, uh, to get, uh, to be bullish again. So we've got a little bit of work to do on the spy. Uh, and I'm not calling a bottom at this point in time. You guys know that I don't really call tops and bottoms, uh, but I will expect to see at least a short term bottom and a one to three month recovery, uh, maybe at the end of the week, uh, moving into at least moving into April. Uh, depending on what the Fed does, depending on what the Fed does with rates. I really do expect that. Um, uh, looking at our indicators right here, we can see that Minx is oversold, uh, which is always kind of a good signal that, uh, hey, eh, 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 watch really closely. Don't be too aggressive to the downside. Uh, we're far away from the median with Minx sitting at negative 94.96. We want to be a little careful and cautious about that. Not really expecting continuation right here. Uh, what I would want to see is uh, price back above 293.25. And then if we close back below, we'll be looking at a continuation short. Uh, we need to get Minx back up into the static right now. Of course, we are still currently, should still currently be in a short on the SPY. Uh, SDS, I'm I'm in another SDS trade, by the way. Uh, so I'm still in that trade. I've taken 50% of my profit off the table. So my stop loss is at break even. We'll go look at the SDS chart right now. Uh, so I can walk you guys through. And I'm taking this trade on Weeble, actually. Okay, um, so here we are on SDS. 
So here it is right here. Here's the continuation filter. So again, here was the initial long signal on SDS. This was also the initial short signal on the SPY. Uh, took the trade right here. Ended up taking about 50% of profit right here. And then I took another 30%. Uh, this was the 27th. Yep, I remember that. Uh, and then I was out again on my trade on this candle close. Uh, who cares? I got a fantastic yield from that. Again, pulled about 13% on the first trade. And then what was it from peak to my second take profit? About 22% and overall got out of the market with my last take profit at about 14%. So overall averaged about 17% on that trade. It was a great, great trade for me. And then I took the continuation trade right here. Uh, this would have been market close on the 6th. Uh, Monday woke up to this gap. And let's look at Quadrigo right here. Quadrigo calling for, we're gonna have to look at historical targets right here. So let's go to this trade right here. I actually took TP2 right here at 31.47 on SDS. Uh, and that's about it. I've taken 50% of my position, my stop loss on SDS is at the close of Friday's candle, which is what 28.37. I actually think it's a 28.40. Uh, I have to double check my Weeble account, but it's 28.40. And that's not to mention that I actually, I mean, if you guys want want, want the real trade, uh, you know, I actually started accumulating SDS over here at about 26.17. So I'd really DCA down into this position and then exited that SDS. But but that's um, that's more true on SH. I'm still holding my initial SH, which is hedging a large portion of my portfolio, which I don't do that often. So I'm still more exposed to the long side, right? I have lost money on this decline in my investment portfolio, but I've significantly... Uh, taken a lot of the bang out. Like I've lost maybe like 5% of my, if I, if I look at my dividend portfolio and that's because I had cash on the sidelines, a lot of cash on the sidelines that I put into SH to hedge my account in traditional markets, uh, that really helped bring that weight down. So I'm cool with that, right? I'm cool with that volatility. And then when I feel that price is low, I'm going to cash out that SH trade and buy up stocks. That was my plan the whole time, right? I'm going to buy up more stocks and I'm going to buy some real estate. That's my plan. Uh, Justin thoughts on Warren Buffett stacking fiat is he, is he knows something your experience? Yeah, he's doing exactly, he's doing exactly what I'm doing, right? I think that Warren Buffett is most likely buying stocks right now. I think that's what he's doing. I think he's buying up the companies that he wants to buy right now. Now, Warren Buffett's probably waiting a little while. He's probably a little bit more, he's obviously clearly more conservative than I am. So I think he's waiting to see. So what, what, what Warren Buffett likes to do is he likes to buy out companies and he really likes to, you know you know, really buy, like buy up entire corporations and companies and guide them through to profitability. So he's kind of waiting to see, you know, what over, you know, what valuable companies like have financial trouble, and then he'll buy those companies up, gut them, restructure them, put the people that he wants in, and then take those and take those up. I don't think that Warren Buffett is stacking stacked cash. I think he stacked cash for the exact same reason that I did, because he saw, you know, because he wanted to be prepared for a market dip. It was 10 years. You know, these things always happen. Um, Let's move on here. Uh, we talked about SDS. Let's go back to traditional markets. We talked about the SPY here. Uh, QQQ, uh, again, sitting at 197.77. Uh, iShares Trust, the Dow sitting at 137.92. Thank you so much for the subscription on YouTube. Shisha, Shishash, Moker, Honk, Shisha, Kisha. Thanks so much for the sub on YouTube, my friend. <laughs> I tried. Uh, energy sector down, XLV down at 92.54. Again, you can pretty much take, you can apply the same methodology to, to, the, to the breaking Bitcoin systems. All of these signal for continuation shorts on Friday for the most part. Uh, we woke up to gra gaps to the downside. Uh, and um, uh, and so there's no signals on pretty much any of the major ETFs. Um, we'll look at the CFDs here in just a second. No signals on the major ETFs. Um, individual stocks are going to be their own thing. But again, broader market exposure trading the ETFs. And there's not a whole lot. I mean, there's not there's just not a whole lot here to do. You know, uh, you should um, almost every short that you've taken on traditional markets, you should be at least 50 percent out and your stop loss should be a break even. Right. You might, depending on where you entered, be trailing your stop loss down a little bit more aggressively uh, and overall be looking over the next few weeks for buying opportunities is my is my is my opinion. Now, looking at gold spot, let's look at the CFD and look at gold. Gold spots. Interesting. 
Uh, we did call this last long trade hitting TP1 here. Wasn't the best gold long trade. We, Of course, we've covered these previous gold spot long trades uh, before as well. Uh, but we did get a previous, we did get a gold long trade confirmed either on this candle, depending on how aggressive you're being, or on this candle if we're waiting for volume confirmation because we did close below the baseline. Again, we talked about staying out of this short and we talked about staying out of this long. We talked about that back at the time when it happened. This was last week. Uh, but we did get another uh, long gold trade here. We actually did it take profit one on this wick out at break even. So again, we talked about this yesterday where you should be properly out of gold right now. Uh, right now, uh, Minx is crossing below the noise line. So we don't have a trade on the table here right now. We are bullish on gold. We are biased bullish uh, as long as we are above 1645, as long as we are above 1640. Uh, this is good to see. If we get a daily close below 1640, we have to be bearish on gold. If we close below 1620, we will begin to look for short positions on gold. Um, so yeah, no, nothing here. Parallax is bullish. Minx is bullish, but it is giving an exit signal. So uh, excuse me, not a proper exit signal, but just to kind of like eh, stay on the sideline signal. So there's really no trade on the table here for gold. So again, flat on gold as far as trading goes. I still I stack gold. Uh, silver again. We talked about not taking silver long. We talked about that very consistently. Uh, silver is still not signaling for a trade. In fact, silver might be setting us up for a short trade. Uh, we're actually getting a continuation short signal on silver today from Minx. Now for me, I would like to see silver close below 1682. Uh, to be closing below the continuation filter. That is another continuation signal right there. But of course, we are below the baseline. We are getting negative volume delta from Wadatar explosion and a rising explosion level and Parallax is bearish. So everything is bearish here on silver. So if one were to take a signal on silver spot based off of these metrics today, <coughs> uh, we'd be looking for initial take profits at 1643, 1592, and 1540. Stop loss at 1772. And of course, invalidation if we close above 1758. Uh, crude oil having a nice little bit of a rebound today after hitting just this gorgeous, gorgeous trade. Again, I talked yesterday, I, I talked about taking, I was uh, I was long on drip, D-R-I-P, the inverse ETF, the 3X inverse ETF uh, for oil in the United States. I'm out of that trade. Bentley crude right now, There, I mean, there's nothing to do here, guys. I talked about this yesterday. There is no trade on oil that I feel is safe. Of course, if you're on lower time frames looking to grab some of that volatility, that's all you. That's not how I trade. Uh, right now, Bentley crude needs to march its way all the way back up to 50 bucks, right? Now, again, some of my friends are calling for $18 a barrel. I would love to see that. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but gas prices are getting pretty cheap. This is good for Main Street America. I think everybody calling for, you know, how bonds are going to unravel and bonds are so full of shale. I think these people are talking out of their rear ends. I don't think they know what they're talking about. Uh, there's also no sh no trade on drip. Uh, so with that being said, let's look at the um, let's look at the big movers of the day here in crypto. And the first thing we have, uh, let's look at again looking at the broader crypto market here today. Uh, again, we can see a, a a fairly positive day for altcoins here today. Uh, we've got some big outliers here: Loopring, Blockstacks, Kyber Network, GNT. Uh, we're not going to even mention Handshake Token because that's a scam. Uh, Mona, Snacks Token, Steam, the Bitmax Token, which I also think is a scam. But uh, all of these are doing fairly well. Tezos up today, XZC. So you know, again, investors, altcoin investors, are seeing a little bit of a boom in their portfolio today, which is nice to see. It's often whipsaw. Uh, but let's break these down. LRC BTC. This is uh, this information is coming from junior analyst Jason. Uh, so LRC on the daily. Now my system is a little different than his, but for his system, uh, LRC on the daily would have already had you in a trade back on March third. Now let's see how that lines up with how I trade. March third, right here. Yeah, not March 3rd for me, but March 4th for me. So Jason's system, a little bit more sensitive. He would have actually been able to get you in on the, oh, March 3rd. I'm sorry, March 3rd. Mine waited until March 5th. Uh, we do see the exit signal for shorts there. Uh, but for me anyways, I would have been looking to enter this on the 4th. Why do I feel like I'm getting whipsaw? 
because I'm on the 20 hour. This doesn't make any sense. Why am I on the why am I on the 20 hour? This is silly. I apologize. Will never happen again. All right. So Jason system getting in here on the third. I would have got a continuation signal or the first proper signal over here on the fifth. Again, very well. Hitting take profit one, probably hitting take profit one, two, three, multiple take profits. One and two on that wick to the upside and then holding and finally hitting take profit three on today's daily candle. Now, Jason's system would have been in a trade on the third, which would have hit two take profits and stop that at break even or take profit one, depending on your take profit strategy and you'd be currently out of this trade. Now, today is representing a continuation signal on the daily, uh, but for Jason, it's a little too far extended to take a full risk position. Uh, it was currently at 618 sats at the time he wrote this. Uh, it is a little too far extended, even for half risk, but watch the daily close for a pullback. Could give it a decent entry for a continuation long at lower risk, maybe one third, or again, maybe even half risk. And LRC here, again, kind of a booming market cap, 47.93 million American dollars. That's about 6,000 Bitcoin, a little bit higher than that. And daily traded volume of $10.5 million. So plenty of liquidity there for LRC trades. Big mover of the day and might get some continuation. Also, a pretty good movement out of steam today. Also, pretty good moving out of steam today. Again, uh, you know, I don't really like to enter on these big, dumb, you know, huge blow up candles. Pretty good moving out of steam today. Not a really good entry on steam, except for about six days ago. Uh, let's take a gander here. Again, Jason's system a little bit different than mine. Again, I have no entry here on steam. Uh, we got some trades over here. This is the last time I went long on steam. And then over here, here's the long signal on steam. About six days ago for Jason's system, which may have been exiting early, depending on the strategy. Obviously would have been rewarded if you held, but currently nothing to do with steam as it has moved too much to take a position. Uh, we can see that from the baseline indicator. Probably getting... Yeah, we're getting the no trade signal from the baseline indicator here on Steam. So need to wait for a pullback. Let's watch the next few days to see if we can get a continuation on Steam. However, we'll note that Steam's market capitalization is $75 million, daily traded volume of 3.9 million. So pretty good volume, pretty good supply right there overall with Steam. We might be seeing some positive follow through of Justin Sun's uh, kind of takeover of the Steam blockchain. Maybe a little bit of investor confidence. I know, uh, I, I would feel more confident about this anyways. Again, but I'm a controversial dude. Uh, now, Ren, moving to Ren, meme coin of the day. Uh, looking at Ren, Ren on the daily did give a continuation long, which uh, Jason actually did take at half risk uh, over, uh, let's see here. I can't remember which one it was. Maybe this one? Uh, because of how far it was from the baseline three days ago at 915 sats. He did close it. Uh, he did close it out at 935 sats, only about 2% because it did seem to be running out of steam. Now, it does still remain above the baseline. Minx is now giving an early exit signal. Uh, as we can see, Minx is giving a take profit long signal. Uh, so definitely one to watch. Ideally, we want to see this one come back down below 822 sats and stay above 736, or excuse me, 750 sats would be ideal for an entry or we need to wait for a signal here. Again, things have been quite positive and bullish here. We can see the initial entry right here from the breaking Bitcoin system. And of course, Minx would have allowed you to be long on that as well. Here's the long signal for Minx. And then on the very next candle, uh, we get water confirmation, parallax confirmation, uh, and baseline confirmation. So one could have taken this and grabbed all of this, all of this delicious Satoshis right here. So again, one to put on your watch list. Let's see what kind of continuation we can get. Ren having a market cap of about 58.12 million, 24 hour volume of about 8.9 million. So a lot of volume here on Ren. Again, meme coin of the day. All right. Now, if you guys are enjoying the content, if you're watching, you know, again, hopefully you guys are doing awesome. Hopefully you guys find the content helpful. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on all notifications. We do post here multiple times every single day. You can follow us on Twitter or Instagram where we do post exclusive content. Make sure to hit the like button and join the Discord. That is the place to be if you guys want to stay up to date. Now we're going to cover the news. We've got some breaking information. We're going to be talking about how this global uh, global pandemic, that is a, that, that's a, a, a double uh, oxymoron. Double negative. Uh, no, not a double negative. Words fail me. Say, you know, it's redundant, right? Pandemic implies global. Epidemic implies localized. So we're going to be talking about how this pandemic might be affecting mining power, hash rate in China. Are we going to see an exodus of hash power out of mainland China and into countries like the United States, Canada, or elsewhere? We're going to be covering that today. And then we're going to be answering your user submitted questions in our Q&A section. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned and we'll be right back.
Now it seems that the perfect storm is looming on the horizon for Chinese Bitcoin miners. With the upcoming happening only two months away, these miners need to secure the latest and most powerful ASIC mining rigs. But the crisis surrounding the pandemic has compounded supply chain issues and led to major setbacks inside China's, inside China's crypto mining industry. Now with Chinese officials, no thank you. Am I caught in a dental emergency? No, I think I'm good. With Chinese officials reporting that they have ostensibly contained the spread of the illness, it seems the country is now slowly recovering from the outbreak and businesses nationwide are beginning to resume normal operations. Yet domestic Bitcoin mining, initially considered to be virus proof, has been hit in China and industry experts are now suggesting there is still a lot more pain to come. Now, thanks due in part to quarantine measures enacted by Chinese authorities, manufacturers of ASIC mining equipment, such as the Beijing-based Bitmain and the Shenzhen-based MicroBT, have been, have been unable to complete delivery to mining farms. Now, China's mining industry, which is mostly situated in the hydroelectric abundant northwest regions of the country, is literally on the opposite end of the country from where the manufacturing takes place on their east coast. Now, reports from outlets like Coindesk show that this supply chain disruption could have been behind Bitcoin's stagnant hash rate last month. Also problematic was a delay in the shipping of the new seven nanometer chips from Taiwan-based manufacturer TSMC. Now, these new seven nanometer chips close, not there yet. These new seven nanometer chips were stated we're slated to go out in late 2019, but delays mean manufacturers are not receiving the new hardware until now in early 2020. These new chips are denser, more powerful, and require less power, and are high in demand among mining equipment manufacturers for their latest generation of ASIC hardware. But even as things return to normal somewhat in China, the mining industry is said to face a so-called Kuang Nong, which means mining catastrophe. Uh, it's sl well, it's slang for pick up the soy sauce, Kuang Nong, uh, and it refers to less than desirable situations you would rather avoid dealing with. So this soy sauce mining disaster is currently trending in the Chinese cryptocurrency industry, as many feel that this unfolding crisis will lead to a massive shutdown of many smaller mining farms inside of China. With the price of Bitcoin staying flat or even dropping further amid the panic, mining becomes less profitable and is putting an unbearable pressure on independent miners and smaller operations. This in combination with the looming having expected in early May of 2020 means miners overdue for their scheduled upgrades to those seven nanometer powered ASICs for their energy intensive proof of work, proof of work mining are seriously hurting every single day they continue to mine without this latest equipment. Now, this is being described as the perfect storm of contributing factors, putting the squeeze on nearly everyone except for the very biggest mining operations in China. Now, the outbreak and its fallout caught the majority of the mining industry by surprise, and those operations that did not upgrade early enough or are last in line for new gear are now facing dire consequences. Industry observers say as the new hardware arrives in mining farms, see a collective upgrade, smaller operators which are still recouping capital expenditures from the purchase of their old mining rigs will be at a severe disadvantage to those better equipped competitors. Now, what's worse, the new chips now arriving will also drive up the hash rate, making it even more difficult for smaller operations with outdated equipment to compete for block rewards. Other industry observers, however, are more hopeful, stating that a mining catastrophe can be avoided, of course. Dan Lee, co-founder of XSJ Mining, a mining farm located in the northwest part of China, spoke to the author of a Decrypt article stating that even if the price drops, miners won't lose everything. He believes that sophisticated miners have recouped their infrastructure costs during the past three years, which is the effective lifetime of the current standard of 16 nanometer chips. So they should be able to afford sunsetting outdating equipment. Now, Lee believes that mining is just like any other energy storage business. Though miners are affected by short-term price fluctuation, the experienced ones understand that to be truly profitable, you need to be in it for the long haul. 
saying, quote, if you look at most energy projects, they are looking out at a 20 to 30 year horizon. The reason is that compared to trading tokens, mining gives steady cash flow as long as the risks are properly mitigated. Now, among the tools available to more sophisticated and well-resourced miners is new hedging financial instruments, such as derivatives being offered by Bitmain and Kanan, designed to protect operators from complete disaster. Of course, we covered previously uh, the reports that many Bitcoin miners, particularly in China, were making heavy use of BitMEX derivatives to utilize the Bitcoin that they mine to actually short sell and actually make more profit in a falling market. Digital merchant bank DAG Global is another institution offering innovative ways for miners to hedge hash rate fluctuation, although this derivatives market for sheltering miners is still very immature and no one knows whether there is really enough liquidity yet there for it to be a viable alternative. So what is to be made of all of this information? Now, Mr. Xu Yao Kong, who's the analyst behind the article, the original article from Decrypt, says that he is still pretty pessimistic about China's smaller mining operators being able to survive the squeeze around this particular happening event. He suggested that it's analogous to how the whales who control, in his opinion, the crypto trading markets, playing the smaller retail investors like suckers. Similarly, the smaller players in China's mining industry are forced to respond to circumstances rather than control them. Their fate is often determined by the electricity price they manage to negotiate. Meanwhile, big mining farms and machine manufacturers move the market. Bitmain, for instance, not only sells rigs, but also mines coins using its latest machines before pushing them to the market. By the time retail miners enter the field, they might just be fresh leaks waiting to be cut by the big miners. But I want to point out another alternative, another narrative here that wasn't really covered in this Decrypt article, which is the fact that there is global competition for hash rate and mining power. Of course, this comes to a kind of a chicken and the egg situation where there is a lot of interest for mining operations here in America and in Canada. But as long as those regulations from the federal government or even from state governments with the exception of Wyoming, remain kind of vague and in limbo, uh, those mining operators aren't really incentivized to expend lots of capital. But here's the thing. Bitcoin mining is a profitable industry. There is a profit incentive. Uh, and just as in all free markets, when there is incentive or when there is an opportunity, which if a lot of China uh, uh, Chinese smaller mining operations kind of do get really hit by this and maybe even have to go out of business, there, <laughs> there's going to be a big demand for... Uh, there's going to be a big opportunity uh, for miners to step in and fill that void. And you have, you know, very wealthy nations or investors, places like Canada, places like Israel, places like uh, places like the UK, places like places in the Eurozone, places like Canada, you know, all over the world. You have individual investors, you have nations, you have economies that are cash rich and are willing to be entrepreneurs because that is how you know the free market works. Entrepreneurs step in to fill a need, to fill a demand, and they strive for a profit incentive. So there's a profit incentive here in Bitcoin mining. So overall, long-term, I don't see this being a big issue for Bitcoin. I see this being an individual issue for Chinese entrepreneurs that are kind of being hit heavily hard by this. So this, this is a short-term issue. I do agree with the writer of this article that we can see more pain for smaller operators, for smaller miners, in China, I think that the larger operators will be just fine, although it's unclear exactly what the extent of the pain will be for smaller operators. But I think that this, again, creates an entrepreneurial opportunity for individuals in other nations that are sitting on cash and are ready to invest in potentially depressed prices to buy up miners on the cheap or to even compete with Bitmain for seven nanometer chip manufacturing. I think that there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of incentive. And overall, for the Bitcoin network, I see this as being positive and just a shakeup of the current status quo. And potentially, this will kind of help get rid of this idea that, you know, uh, you know, mining is centralized in China. Well, there's a reason for that, because electricity is very cheap there. And again, you have other energy cheap countries that have the opportunity to step in and fill this entrepreneurial or economic void. So this is really positive, I think, moving forward. I think this presents a lot of entrepreneurial opportunity for savvy investors who are sitting on the sidelines and want to enter the Bitcoin ecosystem in, this, in the form of mining. Uh, and I think that this will largely be a positive thing. But as always, let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below uh, with your thoughts on this. So with that being said, that ends today's crypto currently section. And we're going to move right into the Q&A section, getting back into the live markets. Excuse me. 
All right, let's see what you got for me today, guys. All right, some interesting questions here today, a few chart requests. <laughs> let's start off this section, as we always do, by opening up this chest for our loyal followers over there on DLive. Midwest, Robin from the Hood, the Pie Guy, thank you guys so much for the donations, highly appreciated. Scrolling back up here a little bit, Robin from the Hood continuing to stack lemons over here, and we're going to, oh, whoops, oh, not the button I meant to press, I put more lemons in the chest, but okay, that's cool for you guys, let's distribute those rewards. All right, so uh, Muhammad Basra asks if we could take a look at Chainlink. Sure, let's look at Link. Uh, Chainlink on the daily here is fairly negative. Uh, again, we got the continuation short on this candle right here. Um, we got Parallax confirmation on this candle. Minsk setting us up for a potential trade here. But again, I think the, the baseline... Uh, and the breaking Bitcoin initiator did a really, really good job here. Just kind of pushing us down into the downside here. Uh, I don't see any opportunities here on Minx. Minx is not oversold. Parallax is not oversold. Uh, we're not that extended away from the baseline. Again, if we kind of take all that off and just look at market structure right here, uh, we can see that um, Link is overall in a consolidation period. We've had a double top, potentially looking for a double bottom. We've we've established a bottom over here at about three dollars and fifty cents. Uh, we are currently making a little bit of a higher high, higher low, excuse me, but a low is not established until we have uh, you know a higher high on 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 two candles to the left and two candles to the right. It takes you know. Five can it takes uh, it takes five candles to form a swing low or a swing high. You have to have the high, two lower candles, two lower candles for a swing low. You have to have a, the lowest candle, two higher candles, two higher candles. That's how a swing low is established. Um, uh, T puppy, you have to do verification in the verification channel. Just follow the instructions, my friend. Um, Uh, let's see, link trading at $3.98. Again, there's really no signals here. We did get a short signal from Minx yesterday, getting some follow through. Uh, so that was the signal. We had rising explosion level on the previous candle. So this is still a valid short signal over there on Binance margin or other platforms where, uh, uh, or, or other platforms uh, where you can short link. I believe you can short it on FTX, although I'm not sure. I don't trade on FTX. Uh, as far as my particular system, again, uh, this is fairly clear. Would have been in a short from this trade from this candle right here. Uh, having follow through, hitting. One. Only one take profit so far. So my stop loss would currently be at four dollars and thirty four cents. And I'd be looking for further downside targets of. About three dollars and fifty cents and three dollars and eight cents. So no exit signal and no continuation signals. Really nothing to do here. Shorts are going to be invalidated on a daily close above $4.44, and we can start looking for longs if we get above $4.60. For our time frame, we are kind of gearing up for a potential push to the upside here, although we are getting a continuation short signal from Minx that's going to be invalidated on the four-hour time frame with a four hour close above $4.10. If we close above $4.26, there is an opportunity here for a short term uh, long. But again, if we take a look at uh, water tar explosion here, again, we're not getting any kind of positive volume delta. We really need to see that again over here. We need to see the chart looking like this on link on the meso timeframes here to really be signaling for a long. So neutral on link. I don't think there's anything to do here with link except for hold the short. Uh, checking out DLive, big winners of the day, Midwest, the Pie Guy, the 178, and Dark Rico. Thank you guys for all the support.
Uh, Crypto Rick asks if I'd spend a minute to explain all the features of the breaking Bitcoin indicator. Yeah, so I'm going to make a big video on this when I publish it. Uh, right now, this is something that I've built and that I'm using myself. So no, not really at this time. Uh, there's an element here where I'd like to hold an edge to myself uh, for a while. But again, I tend to make new systems that are better than the systems that I've built before. And then I publish those and teach people how to use them. And then I go make something else. And then I use that. And then I continue to move on. You kind of get addicted to building systems when you've been in it. And of course, I've got stable systems that I've used here for quite a while. But um, yeah, it would take, you know, it's it's really quite it's really quite simple. There's an initiator and a continuation system. Uh, and when you close above one section, you're bullish. When you close below, you're bearish when you close above the continuation filter you're bullish and i've devised rules here as far as hedging or no trade zones basically when you're below the baseline but above the continuation filter no trade zone when you close back below you can go short uh and very similar for being above the baseline and below the continuation filter for long so uh when i am ready to publish this right now i'm working on uh, right now i'm working on automated strategies with parallax and minx and water tar explosion which i'll be publishing to the group um, and when I'm done with those, I'll work on kind of the timeline for breaking Bitcoin. It's not really, it's not on my roadmap right now. Um, Mr. Ether says, thinking about a stop loss at 68 cents on KNC USD. What do I think? I think you're the man. Whoa, there's not enough data here on Coinbase. So we'll look at, uh, well, and we can't do that. So I guess we're just gonna have to look at USD. Man, this is rough, man. Where are you? Where, where are you? Where are you trading? You got to be trading this on Coinbase, man. You have to be trading this on Coinbase. <clears throat> so we're gonna look at uh, KNC USD as valued by um, Trading View. Um. So first off, uh, KNC is bullish, but we did get an exit signal over here a couple of days ago, so I would be flat. I don't have a continuation signal until Minx crosses back above. You can see the last continuation signal was right here. Put us in for one TP and then an exit at break even. Um, yeah, I don't see a signal here on KNC, but if I were to take a trade on the current candle, my levels would be as such. I'd be looking for profit from $0.90 cents to $1.16, and I'd have a stop loss at $0.59. Cents. Uh, baseline currently sitting at $0.72.65, cents, and... We flip bearish at 64 cents. So 68 cents is where the continuation filter is. So that seems way too tight with volatility. So that's my opinion. Uh, I already talked about Warren Buffett stacking fiat. Palu asks if I hedge my losses or if I use a stop loss. Not really sure what that means. Let's scrub up here. Andrew Munn's dropping some big wisdom in the channel. All right, that's about all I got, guys. And that kind of brings us to conclusion. <coughs> Zooming back out, looking at the markets again, we talked about bottom feeder. We talked about where we are with breaking Bitcoins. We talked about um, we talked about traditional markets. We talked about altcoin markets as well. Uh, we also talked about Bitcoins uh, and, and kind of the China potential catastrophe there. And we also gave some nuance to that as well. So as always, thank you guys so much for joining me. And let's head for the exit over here. Thank you guys so much for joining me for another edition of Breaking Bitcoin Market Analysis. My name is Justin Wise, lead analyst and senior mentor at CrackingCryptocurrency.com. I hope you guys go on to have an absolutely fantastic rest of your day and that you trade safely and you spend your time devising your systems, building your systems, testing your systems, and building a consistently profitable system that will guide you through the volatility of the market as I teach all of my students to do. If you guys are beginning your journey to consistently to consistent profitability and you guys would like to take advantage of all that we offer, make sure to check the link in the description, premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. I want to thank today's partners, Spectre Security Coin, X42. You guys do a fantastic job. Make sure to join us for Trivia Night uh, this weekend for XSPC for Spectre Security Coin. It's going to be a fantastic time. Uh, 
links down in the description for anything that you guys could need. As I talked about, I am moving off of Robinhood. I am kind of tired with the way that they have handled these system outages. I feel that this highlights the fact that they've taken shortcuts in their system. Uh, so I'm going to be moving 50% of my funds to Charles Schwab, 50% to uh, Webull. Uh, Webull has a deal right now where they'll give you two free stocks for signing up. First stock is up to $250 for free just for signing up. Second stock, if you deposit any amount of money, gives you up to $1,400 for the second stock. Link down in the description if you guys are interested. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, or death threats, please leave them in the comments section down below. But ideally, please let me know what you've learned from today's episode. If you guys are watching on YouTube, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and turn on all notifications. We post content here multiple times a day. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram because we do post exclusive content over there. And make sure to join the Discord. I will see you guys there. We will be back tomorrow at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, now that we're off Daylight Savings Time. Same time, every day, same crypto network. You guys have a fantastic rest of your day and trade safely. I'll see you all tomorrow.